It's time for the Longines Chronoscope, a television journal of the important issues of the hour, brought to you every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. A presentation of the Longine Whitnor Watch Company, maker of Longines, the world's most honored watch, and Whitnor, distinguished companion to the world honored Longines. Good evening, this is Frank Knight. May I introduce our co-editors for this edition of the Longines Chronoscope. Mr. William Bradford Huey and Mr. Henry Hazlitt. Our distinguished guest for this evening is General Frank L. Howley, former first military governor of Berlin. Well, General Howley, you uh, rose to fame in Berlin when you talked tough to the Russians and did so much to make a success of the airlift. In your new book, you answer some very important questions, and I'm hoping you'll answer some more tonight. I'd like to begin by asking as a leading question, do you think we're going to win this war against Russian communism? Yes, I'm an American, Mr. Hazlitt. I'm not very good at being a pessimist. Well, what do you think we'll have to do to win it? We'll have to make up our mind that we want to win it. That's the first thing we have to do. Well, is there any general policy that we have to change to win it? Have we been following the wrong policy up to now? Yes, we have to change from the point of view of getting an, an even break or a stalemate into the idea of winning. And that's very American. Who ever heard of an American who wanted to have a tie score in a football game? Well, the $64 question there, sir, is can we win this war without uh, large-scale military action? I believe that we cannot win this war without being prepared for large-scale military actions. In other words, if the uh, Soviets can't have their way in any way except to use force, they'll use force. And they'll only use force if they have more than a reasonable chance of succeeding. Do you think we can get peace honorably in Korea still? Or we get, do you think we can get our objectives honorably in Korea still? We can't afford to do anything which isn't honorable. The honor comes before peace, it comes before victory, it comes before anything else. You can't have a great nation win, lose, or draw if that nation is dishonorable or if they make major sacrifices of principle. Well, you go along with the idea that's been promulgated recently that the Koreans should be able to take over the whole front, that we should train them to take over the whole front and withdraw our own foot soldiers from Korea over that period? I'd say that was purely a military decision, but I will say that as a general policy, countries have to be able to do their share of defending themselves. You can help them, but any country that values democracy will fight for it. And if they won't fight for it, if they aren't willing to go through valley forges and things of that sort, I question that they deserve to have democracy. General Halley, you've had probably as much experience as any American has directly with the Russians and in figuring out uh, how they think. Now, do you think that there is any uh, likelihood of their launching a war in Europe in the near future? There are a great many minds that are trying to work that out. Uh, they'll only launch a military operation in Europe if it's going to succeed and they can't get what they want in some cheaper way. A bunch of pamphlets is a cheaper way if they can cause an internal revolution in Iran. That's much cheaper than a military operation. And your feeling is that as long as these cheap ways uh, show results, they won't try a more expensive man manner. That's right. And the more expensive military operations are, the less chance they'll use. Well, what about the nature of their military preparedness in Europe? Do they have good divisions in, in Germany now, for instance? Yes, I would say that they do have good divisions. They certainly have good divisions in terms of 10, 15, and 20. I don't believe that their economy is such that they can have unlimited numbers of crackerjack uh, divisions. I don't think the intelligence of their people gives them depth of uh, mechanics, for example. Well, do you think the Germans can be trusted on our side in the event of a showdown? I don't trust anybody too much. I think we can trust the Germans to do what is best or what they think is best for Germany. And uh, we're in the position that what is best for Germany is that Germany uh, live up to agreements and stick with the West rather than the East. So that it won't do the Germans much good to uh, 
play hard to get and try to play us against the Russians? Or they oh, probably they'll... won't do much of that, do you think? Oh, they'll do that. That's the international bargaining. They'll do it. The French would do it. And I think maybe we'd be smarter if we did a little more of well, that sort of back thing. In, back in 1945 and 6, sir, I believe you were one of the Americans who was trying to make pacifists out of the Germans. Uh, how well did you succeed? We succeeded far, uh, fairly well, and we were quite sincere. I mean, we really believed that uh, pacifism would work, and uh, it's one of the tragedies that, due to the efforts of Russia, we have had to resume an assumption that military operations may be necessary. In other words, that the policies that you followed in 1945 and 6, you think, were, were correct. That what was wrong was, was Russia's attitudes. Yes, and from our point of view, we were suffering under a great illusion. We thought the Russians were the kind of persons we wanted them to be. Well, do you think the French will do the, what we expect of them? That is to say, do you think the French will uh, really uh, keep on preparing and increasing their divisions? <laughs> the French have a very weak government, and uh, it always puts them in the position where they make a promise, there can be no certainty that they'll live up to it. If they have to go to the people for increased taxation, as they did after the promises at Lisbon, the government may very well fall, and then the agreement is passed by. Well, what a relation has this to the European army idea, this weakness of France? Well, as you know from this latest book, I'm a little skeptical of this long-range idea of a European army. The integration is all right if the units are big enough, but the original notion of small units of different nationalities, I think that that was a good way to get licked against an aggressive enemy. Now we have the European army concept up to divisions of one nationality. It's on still risky, but at least that makes sense. On this recent trip of yours, sir, through Europe, did you find a rising field first of un-American, of anti-Americanism? There is a rising resentment. I don't believe it's really anti-Americanism, but it's kind of a feeling that um, we're using our money to tell them how to live. Well, did you also find a, a rising feeling of neutralism in Europe, more count me out than existed a few years ago? Uh, that's a bit spotty. The Germans, um, a, a few years ago, of course, had this onomic, count me out. And according to Theodore Blanc, who's sort of responsible for whatever rearming they do, at the moment, the sentiment is, uh, unfortunately, uh, not without me. Leider ohne mich. In other words, they're getting a little more fatalistic. They don't want to join anybody's army, but well, a little more. But how about the internal condition of the countries on our side? Is communism gaining or losing in France, for example? In the first place, the Frenchman doesn't know he's a communist very frequently. You mean the one who is? Well, the Even one who's following... Even if he votes for communist ticket? He's following the line or voting yes. the ticket. Uh, I like, I like uh, specific uh, cases. It's like an argument I had with a cab driver. He said he wasn't a communist, but every point of view he had, he got out of reading the communist paper. From the point of view of circulation of the two communist papers, the circulation has fallen of the morning paper, L'Humanité, and the afternoon paper, Ce Soir, it's fallen from about 800,000 down to about 300,000. So that's indicative of a decline. The actual vote didn't fall much in percentages over a period of four years, though, did it? It's pretty hard to tell much about yes. French voting. It's yes. so complicated. Yes. Uh, well, how about the Italian situation on communism? I don't believe that I'd uh, like to comment on the Italian situation. I don't... Uh, I didn't visit there this last summer. And, well, I didn't do any visiting in order to get new ideas. At least I checked up on my notions and convictions, and I didn't go down to Italy. Among our own troops there, sir, on your visit, the six divisions that we have in Central Europe, uh, are those uh, good troops? What's the condition of our troops there? I'd say, uh, Mr. Ewey, that our soldiers, uh, we can be proud of them. They look good. They're magnificent in behavior on trains. You can't tell the difference between officers and men. They're so well-dressed. And thanks to the training methods of recent years, I believe they're good combat soldiers. Of course, there's no, no final test except combat, but they're given plenty of training. Now. Is there any reason why we should maintain six divisions of troops in Germany now? 
I think right now we have to, yes. But I think, I think it's an unsound position that Americans stand there defending Germans. Let them fight their own battles. You At the moment, though, we have to have them there to give the French a feeling that we won't back out on our commitments. You speak of a policy of aggressive righteousness in your book, I believe. Now, what do you mean by aggressive righteousness, General? I mean, let's do what's right. Let's think it out and do the American thing, the principal thing, and start with that, and then convince our allies that it's good for them. Let's not start and set a policy based on what we think we can convince somebody that they ought to do. Let's start off with the correct basis of what is right. Now, your, your book, which is titled Your War for Peace, is getting a good deal of attention, sir. Uh, what is the purpose? Why did you write this book? I wrote it to cause the individual citizen to think about our foreign policy. And, and do you feel, sir, as a final question, do you feel that, uh, that we will ultimately uh, understand the nature of the enemy and the nature of the war and that we will ultimately win this struggle? Yes, I do. And, uh, well, sir, thank you very much for being with us this evening. The opinions that you've heard our speakers express tonight have been entirely their own. The editorial board for this edition of the Longines Chronoscope was Mr. William Bradford Huey and Mr. Henry Hazlitt. Our distinguished guest was General Frank L. Howley, former first military governor of Berlin. Loss in the dim past is the origin of the saying, consistency, thou art a jewel. It suggests to us that there is an extra jewel in every Longines watch, and that's the jewel of consistency. You see, consistency of quality made Longines the world's most honored watch. The prizes and the medals which Longines watches have won at world's fairs and international expositions and from the great government observatories are tributes to the consistency of the quality of product maintained by Longines throughout its history. Now today's magnificent Longines watches are the finest in Longines' long 87-year history. Each has that extra jewel of consistency, and you can depend upon it that each will deliver in full measure the greater accuracy and the longer life for which Longines watches are world honored. So, if you'd like to own just about the finest watch made anywhere in the world, you will choose well to choose Longines, the world's most honored watch, the world's most honored gift, premier product of the Longines Whitnor Watch Company since 1866, maker of watches of the highest character. I invite you to join us every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday evening at this same time for the Longines Chronoscope, a television journal of the important issues of the hour, broadcast on behalf of Longines, the world's most honored watch, and Whitnor, a distinguished companion to the world honored Longines. This is Frank Knight, reminding you that Longines and Whitnor watches are sold and serviced from coast to coast by more than 4,000 leading jewelers who proudly display this emblem, Agency for Longines Whitnor Watches. Wednesday night, the big fights on the CBS television network.